Hi, Dagger Burf and Dagger Burf's Tackle World here in the Gold Coast at uh, Labrador, or Harbour Town. Uh, we are here today to tell you all about whiting fishing. Um, for those of you who live in South East Queensland, all the way up to probably even Cairns, uh, and down south to probably to where you start to get King George whiting, but all of our summer whiting area, um, this is how I do it. I think the same scenario will work in most areas. And uh, of course, it you know, depends on tides and, and uh, where you're fishing in, whether it be sand flats or weed beds or rivers and, and deep water. Um, but this is how we catch uh, yellowfin whiting, which is summer whiting. Uh, they grow to, our biggest is around about 45 or 46 centimetres by memory, which is around about 800 grams, 780 grams, I think it was. Um, you rarely see a kilo size whiting on 50 centimetres. If there is one caught, it's generally from an enclosed lake or occasionally in the wild, but not, not so much. Uh, they're generally um, they're commonly caught around that 23 to 32 centimetre size. When you've got consistency in size around 32 to 40, uh, they're very good fish and uh, they're so nice to eat. Oh my gosh. So today, when we talk about uh, all the gear you need and, uh, and how I do it, I've been doing it now for started probably fishing for whiting when I was about five with my dad, so 50 years ago, so um, a bit over 50 maybe. <laughs> and now, uh, this is what I use, and I'll just run through each of the items here, uh, and we'll start right here. So, uh, hook size, um, very debatable. Um, I used to use, many years ago, long shank. Everyone said to use a long shank. Hey, they're not a bad uh, hook for, for using good size yabbies on. Uh, I'd say terrible for using worms on and terrible even for using yogis on, to be uh, to be honest with you. Um, I don't mind selling them, but uh, you know, the big sellers we sell are like the Shinto's or other brands in the red color. Um, these aren't too bad as a long shank. I remember years ago, there was a mustard hook called a four, five, four and a half, which is half as long again as the 3191 mustard. And it was just a crazy long hook. And I, I didn't know back then, but I've learned many years later that uh, if your shank is exposed and your bait's halfway down the shank, unless it's a stupid fish or a little fish or a toadfish, um, it, you probably won't get a bite, you're wasting your time. That hook has to be concealed and covered, whether it's a yabby or a worm or whatever, all the time. Hence, I don't use many long shanks. Other reason, I dig up my own bait, I catch my own bait, but if you buy bait, you buy worms or you buy yabbies, very expensive. And uh, it's a lot of talking live bait. And, um, that extra half a length of shank hook compared to say a, a bait holder hook or, or a shorter type hook um, is a lot lot more money in the cost of bait. So if you don't mind spending money on bait, hey, use your long shanks, but make sure you pull it up the top of the over the top of the hook. Anyhow, so I don't use many long shank hooks. I sell lots of them, I don't use them. Um, personally, I like to use a, a bait holder hook. The one that holds the worms up better, holds the yabies up better. You rarely break it on the on the slice of the shank. Sometimes you do try and get a look at that hook out of the fish's mouth, but you'll never break it on the fish itself, catching the fish. Um, show you comparison of the hook size here, I'll just take out one of each. Quite a bit of difference in the shank size. And definitely uh, by far better that you uh, focus on uh, using a little bit shorter shank hook. I don't like to use the really short shank hooks, like French hooks and that because they tend to be buried right down the back side of the, of the whiting and just a nightmare to get out. I mean, you cut your lead all the time, leave the hook in the fish's mouth if you're going to keep them, and uh, you'll end up with a, a shorter length of leader and a three tire leader again, so a bit of a time waster. So uh, we don't use the, the real short shank hooks, we use a medium shank. So I haven't got a short shank here, but I'll just show you these two differences in, in length and shanks, so you understand what I'm saying. Both very similar in the gape, but a lot, uh, if you can see that, a lot, uh, oops, a lot uh, difference in the shank size. So I'll take a photo of this later and show you guys anyhow. You can see what I'm talking about. So I use this little um, medium shank here in the hook size. Hopefully you can see that. Um, so that's the first thing. It's called, this was actually an instinct hook. Um, it's called a bait holder worm hook made by instinct. These actually made of stone steel, by the way. Very good hook. The other hook I like to use, um, they are a tiny bit shorter, but not as short as a short chain. Also bait holder, extremely sharp. Another Shinto product. 
The shinto tend to use the Japanese steel, so they're a lot sharper, nicer, stronger, and they're just a beautiful hook. But again, you can see it's a little bit longer than a, than a short shank hook. It has the barbs on the back here to hold the bait on better. It's a bent over eye like a French hook, so it holds the bait on even a bit better up the top when you pull it up over the eye. And, uh, and just a really good little hook. That's a size three. So size four and size three are my two favorite sizes. I see guys using size six and size eights. Um, they're great, but they get right down their backside. You can't put a, a medium or a big yabby on those little hooks, they're too hard. Worms, not too bad, but again, folding the worm around that little tight shank is quite hard enough the time you rip the worm apart, putting it on. So I like that little bit bigger gate, size four, size three. That's enough about hooks, okay? Uh, next thing, uh, my line. Okay, I use about uh, six to 10 pound braid uh, on my lines. This is actually 10 on here now, some little, uh, little uh, sustain, uh, 10 pound braid. Um, what is 10 pound braid? Because generally I use this rod for everything, flatties, uh, the whole work. So it's just on there and for whiting, I find it makes no difference. Um, the other thing too with braid is, uh, I prefer not to use mono, unless I'm using an LB reel. It's the only time I'll ever use mono. Um, but the braid these days is extremely thin. So this is, um, I know you can't see it there very well, I'm sorry again, but this is 10 pounds. Uh, it is extremely thin. If you can see that, uh, its thickness is 0.1, sorry, take two. Its thickness is, 0.13. So most four pound monos, okay, we're talking four pound mono, is around about 0.16. So this is actually 10 pounds, so two and a half times stronger than the four pound mono, uh, but 20% uh, thinner. So it's extremely strong, extremely thin. When you get a bite, it's like boom, 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 boom. When you get a mono bite, even a four pound line, it's, it's quite not as aggressive. A little bit slower, when you hook up, your delay is slower. Braid is instant. With whiting, uh, I'll talk about it in a moment, but when they bite, you, you feel it in the gut, you know it's in their gut, and when you strike, they're, they're on. That's simple as that. Just a lot easier to feel. Uh, so that's my braid. Brand of braids, oh, sorry, but brands of braids, most braids are pretty good these days. Just the higher the price, the thinner it gets, the more carriers, it's as simple as that. Uh, as I said, braid resistance, when you're fishing for whiting, if, you, if you're fishing around a, uh, Somewhere we're going to break your, your line off on whiting, you're probably not fishing for whiting. So don't worry about that. Uh, sinker size. Now, this is very important. Um, when I'm fishing on the flats, which we'll talk about a bit later, um, I'm using uh, no sinker at all. So I'm running my line that one he set up in the other day. So I'm tying my hook directly to my eight pound. Um, fluorocarbon leader, which we can talk about, talk about in a minute. And my lead is about, uh, how long is that? So just past the rod tip, so it's about a metre long. Um, my my sinker, I hook straight there. There's no sinker, no swivel. Just got an all bright knot uh, tied to my line and my, my hook's there. When I'm fishing the flats, I'm generally using yabbies. Okay, I'll let you know, I'll talk about that a bit later. But that's how my rig's set up, so uh, no sinker. That is the extreme case of uh, where you get the lightest with no sinker. But obviously in the boat, you generally are always using a sinker if you're fishing more than a metre deep. Or you a lot of current, or a lot of wind drift, whatever it might be. Uh, the heaviest sinker I'd use for whiting is probably about a four ball. So if I'm fishing up the river where the current's ripping, it's probably doing three knots or whatever it is in the, when it's ripping out in the big tide. And it's around the Gold Coast, you might get a, a metre and a half, two metre tide. Um, that's about as heavy as I'll go. I always cast my line on a little bit of an angle behind the boat and um, never out straight. Occasionally I do if I've got a, uh, two guys fishing with me, another guy fishing with me and we've got, got to place that rod strategically, then I might cast it straight at the back, but it's always on a bit of an angle. So size four ball is the biggest size I use. It's a running sinker, sits above a swivel rig, just like this one here. Which was just the other night up in Rang. Uh, you'll see some Rang River. You'll see some pictures in, in later in this um, episode when it comes out. I might be caught. Uh, but that was my rig on the night. So a four ball sinker, swivel, number six crane, and the little uh, Shinto hook on this one. Or Shinto number three. Okay. My 
My lead is about 50 centimetres long. Don't make your leader too long. If you make your leader too long, especially if you've got bigger sinkers on, it tends to spring around and get always caught up. So even a bit shorter like this length is, is okay. Say 30 centimetres, 40 centimetres. All right. Uh, so fluorocarbon leader, I skipped that before. FC leader, um, I like to use eight pound. It's eight always for on a winding fishing. You don't need to use six, you don't need to use four. Um, you get this bigger winding, you know, for about 35 centimetres. Um, particularly if you're boat fishing, they really dive down hard at the back of the boat into the current. And if you pull, even though they're only maybe 700 grams for a good sized fish, um, it's not the weight of the fish, it's actually his pressure pulling is probably around three kilos or something. So, um, I like the little pop, easy six pound leader. Eight's borderline, I've even had eight pop sometimes, but generally speaking, very rarely. And obviously, you, you, know, you set your drag accordingly, and they pull a bit harder, it's going to pull a line off. So, eight pound fluorocarbon. I'm spraying here, um, actually, it's like a little brand, this one's dog tooth in the um, eight pound HQ series. That's the high quality one. Um, swivel size, yeah, so size six cranes I spoke about in my rig before. Um, I love to use crane swivels, they have a lot less twist. I find barrel swivels, don't mind selling them, but they're, they tend to be a bit long in the spindle above the barrel and on where the loop is and therefore they don't turn as easy. Uh, the cranes are very precise, very short, very neat, and they spin quite easily. Not as good as a ball bearing swivel, but the next best thing to it. Um, they're a lot more compact as well. The barrel swivels are quite big and bulky, and if I was a clever fish, I'd sort of get it and swim away. So the less concealed it is, the more concealed it is, the better it is. So size six black crane. These are black ones too, by the way. Okay. Um, bait. Okay, bait is a, a very important thing. Um, you know, I've been, I used to fish club years ago and I learned from some of the best fishing guys from uh, the clubs back in the day. Victory Fishing Club, I did a lot up there in Brisbane. Um, and we fished, obviously I lived in the Gold Coast, but the club was in Brisbane. Um, with Robbie Miller, Peter Miller, and some of the best whiting fishermen out there in our area back in the day, 20 years ago, 15 years ago. and. Uh, did my apprenticeship there in getting that little bit next step higher up in catching mining. And um, they told me that bloodworms was um, the best. I don't know if you've ever dug bloodworms out of the mangroves. Uh, terrible job. <laughs> I'm still suffering from the other day. Uh, but um, you're up to your testicles in mud, if you don't want me saying that. And um, one leg comes out, the other leg goes all the way down the same height again and depth again, and uh, you try and walk your way up to the edge of near the mangrove roots. Uh, you dig your hands down to around this far down. So try and get up to near your, close to your elbows. And you put two hands down and you pull that, probably, I don't know, around six or eight kilos of mud back. And then you do next to that and pull that back. And then you then work forward, pulling into that hole that you just dug. And as you're pulling the mud back, you look and you see hopefully like a spaghetti strand going down and that's a worm and you dive the other hand down deep into this trying to retract back into the mud and grab him and, and, uh, and, and then go sort through the mud and hopefully get another one worm or two worms. If you're in a jackpot, you might get five or six. Um, but there are many digs where you get nothing and it's like, I want to give up. But uh, you just keep going. So back in the day, we used to get a lot of worms because you had to get a lot of worms. You get a lot of whiting those days, unfortunately. We kept lots of whiting because that was the way it was back in the 80s and 90s or the early 2000s. So, um, but now it's all different. Anyhow, uh, cut on so short. I do use beach worms sometimes, uh, particularly at the Narang River when I'm fishing out there. It's my favourite uh, whiting haunt. And uh, last time I was up there, we uh, I took my dad up last Sunday night. This is uh, in November, so for those of you who watch it, but whenever you watch it, uh, 2020. Anyhow, um, we got about 40 whiting. We got a real good catch of whiting because it's 40 centimetres. Um, and we ran out of, of worms. We had about, between the two of us, about 40 worms. Um, and uh, so that gives us, it's sort of like a worm, a fish, because you get bycatch, you get um, toadfish, catfish, eels, brim, driving you crazy. Crabs grabbing your bait. So your bait is, you can even get two or three baits out of a worm, it equates to about one whole worm to one fish at the end of the day. So uh, if you want to get 100 whiting, and back in the old days, we needed 100 worms to get 100 whiting per person. 
Uh, so, we don't do that these days, so you know that. So anyhow, um, we were in our boat with us and I thought, geez, it, I was having been for a while, and I thought, dude, bug worms is still a go, it's still so great. A couple of days later, a mate rings me up and he goes, do you want to go for a whiting fish up? And he's a quite good fisherman. And I said, look, I don't really want to go and dig those bug worms, it is too bloody hard. And he said, um, no, bug worms, he goes, those use beach worms. And he always, always sees photos on Facebook, he gets lots, Steve Vince. And I said, Steve, no, wait, no way, I'm having a bug worms. He goes, no, beach worms, they're fine. I said, okay. So I zipped out the beach and dug 30 beach worms and, and uh, we went out that, that night and I could not believe it. Seriously, the fish were biting. It's only two nights later than the previous night, two nights ago, blood worms. And the fish were biting as crazy on the uh, beach worms as they were in the blood worms. And I just thought to myself, I'm never going to eat blood worms again. <laughs> Save the mangroves. <laughs> so, um, folks, you don't need to have blood worms. I'm telling you now. The other night, I actually had a couple of tails and bits and pieces left over from the blood worms from the night before, two nights before. And uh, I caught, I think the, blood, the beach worms are even going harder than what the um, blood worms were when I was still using. So it's not a necessity as much as you think. Yabbies are the next one. So we've got blood worms, we've got beach worms. Blood worms we dig from the mangroves, uh, around the mangroves in the mud. Beach worms we catch on the beach. If you want to see how to catch beach worms, just jump on our on, our, on this YouTube channel and uh, look for the beach worm segment and you'll see how we pull the beach worms out of the sand on the beach. There are literally millions of them on every beach, everywhere. So um, go to the, down the Gold Coast here amongst you know, 500 people swimming or sunbathing on the beach and just pull beach worms out between them. They're just everywhere. Uh, just an art to catch in it. But once you've got a few, you can understand how easy it is. The yabbies is the next thing. So yabbies are, are not too bad. So when I went up with my dad the other night on the first night, we had some yabbies as well. I'll be honest with you, we only caught a couple of fish on yabbies. It was, uh, we had a yabby out as a sacrificial bait on one of the rods most of the night. It, it got bitten a fair bit and only bite the heads, they bite the heads off. And uh, we were too busy catching them on the worm. So, but it was nowhere near as good as as the worms on the two nights. So uh, yabbies are a third number, uh, probably number four in your bait. So blood worms, beach worms. Number three is what we call preserved beach worms, which you can buy at most tackle shops. And most tackle shops have a worm supplier or a bait supplier that sells good quality uh, preserved worms like so. So these are actually straight out of the freezer, but they're not frozen, as you can see, they're, they're soft as. Um, so, but they're tough, they're really tough. So they've been, brined in like a metho and salt and food coloring solution. That's why they're quite red, like a blood worm. It's got a bit of sand on them, of course. Um, and uh, I'll just peel a bit of the sand so you can see what it looks like without the sand on it. You can see that, how red it is. They're not normally that super red, but they color them to make it look like a blood worm. These work extremely well. They're like they are, at times, they, when the fish are really biting hard, they just, they just hold them to them. But when the fish are a bit quiet, I'll still take these uh, with no problems at all. Um, the thing I like about them is they're tough to put on the hook, they don't fall off easy. Um, they're easy to put on the hook because they're not squirming around. So when you've got uh, live fresh worms, they're very slimy, and especially the head section, it tenses up, and it's very hard to get the hook in. Um, I can't blame the worm, but uh, it's uh, a lot easier to put, to put up the bait on. So if you don't want to catch worms and or buy live worms, or don't want to use live worms, or some people don't want to use live, live critters, um, they're definitely the go, okay? So um, that's the go. So that's your bait, uh, and those four baits there. Going down to tackle. I'll straight put that on the moment too, folks. Uh, reel size, I like to use about a two and a half to a 3,000 size reel. Um, I'm using my eight pound braid and my eight to 10 pound braid, even at the 15s, if you've got a thin one, um, and my eight pound leader, okay? Um, if you're using an LB reel, now, when I fished years ago in club, we, if I took one of these rods onto the boat with the guys I fish with, they'd probably stab me, <laughs> or told me to get off the boat and go home. Um, it was all LBs, it was six inch LBs, 10 pound mono, eight pound mono, and um, a long rod, 10, 10 foot six to 11 foot four. I can't show the length of this rod because it's just too long, but this is the type of outfit that I used to use and I occasionally do use, and a lot of old school guys still like to use. Um, 
they are great, but I've since learned over the years that it doesn't catch me any more fish. I've got the little ones, little spin reels, um, I catch one on one. So I wish I had known that years ago because it's easier to see the tip. This one is squinting and trying to see the tip move at the end of the boat because you don't hold your rods, okay? You watch your rod tip, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, but to use something, you probably can't see the length here, but this is uh, extremely long. That's only half the rod that you're looking at there. The other half's hanging out past the, the camera and uh, they're very soft. So I'll pull this around this other way. It's 16 gel by two way. Really, my, still my favorite, I was only using season surf. Um, my, still my favorite surf reel for catching dart and whiting brim. Well, I do use that bit sometimes. But that's the, um, the tip. The tip's very light, very, very soft, okay? And uh, you watch that tip and you'll, you'll see it bow, you'll see the bite, if you can see that. And when they bite, uh, the bite, you sort of see what you grab it. And uh, what you do, you'll just, uh, progress to that. Actually, why don't I go through this a bit more? <laughs> but that's the rod tip, it's very, very soft. Okay, uh, tools. Uh, you want some scissors. What are your scissors? I use scissors, obviously, to cut my braid and cut my mono. But I all season for cutting the bait, especially when it's live. When you try and pinch the bait here with your fingers to um, to break it up, because my average size piece of bait, which I'm just about to uh, cut off now, is about this size for my hook size. Okay, it's about double the length of the, of the size of hook. You can see that. Um, so when you try to pinch it with your hands to break it, sometimes the, the, you'll break the worm, you'll stretch the worm. You squeeze all the stuff out of the worm. You don't want to do that. You just want to clean cut. So when they're live, just cut, 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 cut. Put them onto a, a, like a towel or a, a rag. And whilst you're fishing, they're squirming around and they're getting the slime off. And when that next bait goes onto your hook, it's a lot easier to grab and a lot easier to use. And it's generally semi-dead. It's still moving around. When it goes into the hook into the water, it's still moving around. Um, but it's just a lot easier to use, okay? So scissors, a necessity. Good scissors too. This is a Gamoku's, Gamoku what you call. Um, and then I use pliers, obviously. We get bycatch around this area called catfish eels. I don't know if you know them, but they're the white and black striped ones. Um, sometimes when I've been very sleepy at night time over the, day, over the years, and I think it's a whiting, I'm a bit sleepy, I just grab it and I get impaled. And the whole arm just burns for about three or four hours, you know, paralyzed. They're very dangerous. They've got spikes on the side that are highly venomous. So um, the catfish eels is grab them with the pliers and cut the line and drop them back in the water. Uh, so pliers are a necessity. Other thing too is um, whiting will swallow the hook right down the belly. And uh, if you don't want to split the lip, which I'll talk about a bit later, um, you use the pliers to dig down and, and get the hook out. Um, and or hook out tool. Hook out tool goes down the throat too, grabs the shank of the hook. You pull on the trigger, turn it, and it just pulls the hook out. But you need to be able to see that shank at night uh, to do that. Daytime's okay, but nighttime's very difficult. Um, okay, it's about tools. Um, tools for catching your bait. Okay, so as I said, watch our worming uh, video on YouTube or watch the Yabby one on how to dig yabbies, and you'll see what we're using. So when we're fishing for the beach worms, we're using a, like a scaling bag with about two meters of rope with fish frames in it to attract the worms. I have a bait bucket on my hip, on belt, and as I catch the worms, I go straight into the little bait bucket and clip it down and just eventually they fill up. And I have a bucket just to put clean water in and the beach worms go from there into the bucket of water. So I've got clean water at home. Uh, that's the only tools you need for, for um, catching worms. For yabbies, um, obviously you need a yabby pump. Folks, if you're going to buy a yabby pump, um, I'd suggest getting it. Elvis the original, Wilson's, I think was made after Elvis, obviously. Um, both are good, both are made in Brisbane, uh, but the Elvis the original one. Um, I used to dig yabbies for bait shots when I was a kid, pro, and they both last about the same, okay? Uh, but these days I, I still use Elvis, but anyhow. Um, and 30 inch, get the king size pump. Don't get the little short one. Uh, even for kids, you're better training them on the longer one than the shorter one. Um, it's because, not because it's easier to pull out, but the short one just doesn't get down deep enough. That longer one, just that extra couple hundred, 200 mil longer, 
And the third pump is where the yogis are down that deep apart. Watch the video, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. And a sieve. Um, a lot of people say, oh, I don't need a sieve, I'm not digging at high tide. It's not about the high tide, the sieve part. It is a video in water, but it's more about um, how to keep your yabbies fresh when you dig in the yabbies. So uh, rather than carry a bucket of water around, the bucket of water gets quite warm. Um, and whilst you're doing the yabby digging for half an hour or an hour, and the, yab the yabbies are really starting to get overheated and they die, they've got to stay cool most of the time. The sieve, um, obviously when you dig in yabbies, you're digging in areas that where the water's sort of just semi over the sand and there's a lot of puddles of water in the vicinity and some of those puddles are flowing, that clean cold water, sort of not, not hot water. And um, the sieve, you don't pump into the sieve, you pump next to the sieve or on the sand, you pick the yabbies up, put them in the sieve which is sitting in a puddle in that nice clean flowing water. And, uh, and just to make sure that the sieve's not under the water, <laughs> as I saw sort of mine. Um, and then when you just pump that area, you pick your sieve up and you move over to three metres to the next puddle and you dig around that with the sieve sitting in the puddle and you'll pick them up and put them in the sieve. So uh, that's why you use a sieve. And uh, just a bucket, the bucket to uh, obviously change the water. It's only three tools you need, the over pump, sieve and buckets. So that's all the gear you need. So that'll be a photograph at the end. You can have a look and decide what you want to do your way, but uh, please try my way works uh, okay so we've got the gear we put our bait and we're gonna go fishing so we think about the tides um, you catch one in all tides my favorite there are certain tides which are my favorite um, if I'm fishing say up the river um, I really like high tide around about um, around six or seven at this time of year in November just before dark and it's sort of slowed down and as the tide just starts to turn it's just gone dark and they normally bite their heads off, they go crazy for up to the whole run out tide sometimes, but generally speaking, two or three hours. First two hours are really good. Um, the other tide I like up the river is um, in the, during the night is any time if you get low tide at say seven or eight, so you miss that stage of the tide, you get up there, you fish the last the run out, and the last half hour of the run out when the tide's been running hard, then it slows down, they'll really come on the bite. They'll bite for about half an hour, they'll bite crazy. Uh, the tide goes dead, as does the fishing. But no fun, no run. No run, no fun, sorry. Uh, and then um, as soon as that tide starts to trickle back in and just starts to get going, they just they just come on again. And they'll bite hard until sometimes they'll bite all, all the running tide. Uh, but generally for about the first hour or two. So that's the two stages of the tide. If I'm land-based fishing, which is in this scenario here, and uh, the tide, uh, for me, I like to dig yabbies. I'm using worms at the river predominantly, and I'm using yabbies on the flats or if I'm land-based walking the shoreline. Um, I get there that low tide, I love low tide. I dig my yabbies on the low tide, it's easy. And then as soon as that tide starts to creep in, um, I'm using nose sinkers we talked about earlier, um, the fish tend to move, not so much, oh, it, is, it is actually with the water rising, but they're working with the water temperature. Okay, so um, the water's cool, that's out there a bit deeper, it's coming in, but the water's warm in the shallow, uh, on top of the sandbanks as it's rising up, and they're sticking with that sort of bit warmer water. So they're not staying out in the deep where it's cold, they're, they're moving up with that warmer water, and you just gotta keep stepping back on the sand flats with it. So you don't actually change it, uh, you do actually, don't just actually stand there with the water deep around you. You actually keep working back so the depth is similar all the time on you. Does that make sense? So if the water was that deep and that was that warm and you catch a fish in it, try and keep in that depth all the way up as the tide comes in on your body. Hopefully that makes sense. As long as, as, long as the, uh, the sand's sort of fairly flat, if it dips in it, it might change. Uh, but yeah, so that's how, that's how I do it. I base my depth as to where I'm going to uh, move. And if it goes up more than two or three inches above where I've been fishing 20 minutes earlier, um, and I generally feel the water getting a bit cooler, I think, okay, it's time to move it. I'll move in 10 metres up the flats a bit higher um, and back up to where I was at the same depth earlier and the water will be that bit warmer again. And that's where they are. I keep working with that, temp with that water temp. So please remember that little trick. Okay, 
So let's talk about our land base while we're here. So this is a land based scenario. If we will show pictures a bit later on so you can see it, but um, sorry, I mean, it's a bit hard to see, focus on where we are. But this scenario here, what I've written, uh, the green is actually sandbank, sandbanks out, okay? This is a foreshore here. And um, this is a little, a little channel, another sandbank out a little bit. That's the main channel out there. Um, but this little channel here, this white part in the middle, the blue arrows, um, this is the way the tide's coming in, okay? So it's low tide down, and this water's starting to flow through this little, uh, little area here. So what's gonna happen is the fish at the river out, uh, in the channel out here are gonna either swim down this way, but we can't walk out because it's too deep to get across to it. So we're land based. So out here, this is sandbar. Um, this little dot here area is about probably say half a metre or a metre deep. And it goes around, comes quite deep in here, very deep there, then it goes back out again out here. So um, I'm gonna guess the fish are gonna come down through here because they can't get out to here. So I'm gonna stand pretty close to the shoreline here or just on the edge of the, of the water and cast my line out where it drops off on this edge, this little dot here, because it goes from sort of maybe a metre deep to two metres deep. The, as the tide's flowing over that drop off, there'll be stirring up at the bottom, there's yabby holes there, and the whiting will be feeding along there, just along the edge there. They'll be coming down this channel, and then they'll stop and they'll drop in and just sit on here. So I'm casting my line out across the current, and I'll let that come down and hopefully land just on that same area. And I'll fan cast that area to try and find where they are. Once the tide starts to get over this flat here, they'll move from here and here, and they'll come up on here to feed. So they'll come up on here. So this is my first cast is here. Um, I'll just walk this bank here, maybe fish around this area here, or I'll come down to here. This is maybe 150 metres up the track or 200 metres up, up the uh, beach. But I'm thinking, okay, they're gonna come here soon, but if I get down to here, this current's coming here, so any fish that doesn't wanna stop there will keep going down here to this flat here. And I'll stand here and I'll cast on this flat here, my unweighted yabby. I'm casting it slightly up current and letting it come down with the current. And I'll just work this whole area here, cast, wait, and if I don't get done, I'll just move across 10 meters or five meters, and I'll cast again. I'm only casting maybe about 15 metres, not far, because it's obviously got no sinker, so, um, but you can cast light line quite well, particularly on a thread line. It'll be a bit harder because you've got to get the inertia to pull it off a six inch reel or a five inch reel. It's a little bit difficult. Uh, a thread line's a lot easier in that scenario. Um, so that's what I'm doing there. Then as the water starts to get deeper here, um, that's when I said the fish will come back up on this big flat here and they'll start feeding here. So I'll go back to here and I'll work this flat here, obviously pushing back as that tide gets um, um, too deep. And then they'll then spread out over the flat. So this is the easiest time to catch them before they get up in the flat. Once they get up in the flat on high tide, there's so much, much area they can swim around in. So you, you haven't got a, um, a concealed audience, captive audience <laughs> to cast at. They just spread out. So it gets a bit harder to find them. So you just then just walk the bank here and, and try and find where they are. So that's what my scenario would be here. So try and find out where they're coming in to the area with the current, uh, work with drop off, head over to the next flat that the water's gonna push onto. Always remember, and, and any reef fishing, any fishing, wherever the current hits something, that's where they feed, any fish feeds, okay? That's the normal thing, feeding procedure of a fish. Um, and yeah, and then I'll work the flats as it comes up. Good luck on that one. Um, and then now we're talking about uh, the river. So I tend to fish the rivers uh, more nighttime than daytime. Um, I catch all my fish on the flats and walking the flats uh, daytime and not much nighttime. So it's a complete opposite scenario. Why? I don't know. <laughs> That's just the way it's always been in my history. Uh, but um, rivers, nighttime. So this is a scenario so up in Rang River somewhere. Um, we still have red and green beacons all the way up in the Rang River and, and the channels. Uh, a lot of six knot zones. But let's just say we've got a bank here. This river's maybe 100 metres wide. And we've got a bank here that's uh, maybe 
30 meters out the shoreline and it's quite shallow, about a meter deep at low tide, maybe two and a half meters deep at high tide. And we've got a red beacon here to tell you to stay on that side of the, of the, that side of the uh, channel. Um, otherwise you've got a big boat, you might hit the bottom here. Um, so well, this is my scenario. I've gone up here at 6.30 at night, it's still daylight and the tide's just starting to run out. So any widening that's in this area here, in this big, this is maybe 80 meters across, that are sitting in this deeper water. As soon as the tide starts flowing, the top of this bank, which is still a meter underwater, a meter, two meters underwater, is gonna start getting stirred up with the current. And all on this edge here, they're gonna be just, they're gonna all come from here and stack up along here and feed whatever comes off this bank because the tide's flowing this way. So I will sit, this is my boat, little blue one here, or the other, and I'll sit here and I'll cast towards the red beacon and over that edge, so that drops off to maybe five meters deep. So it goes from one and a half to five meters deep. And anywhere along that edge is where they'll be sitting, feeding. So I'll cast one line out, uh, side on. I'll cast a second rod out uh, on a different angle there. And if my mate's in the back of the boat with me, I'll tell him to cast his just behind my rod there and do a long cast on, still on an angle and let it come down and hopefully we should all pull fish. Um, if that gets a little bit quiet after maybe an hour or so, the fish might have moved down 60 or 80 meters down, down the uh, channel a bit further. Again, I'll use my sounder, I'll go out to the deep and I'll come back up and the, when the sounder starts to come back up again, I'll just mark it on my screen on the plotter and then I'll then drive up in that shallow direction um, and see where I'm going to sit and throw my anchor out and hopefully drop back to the current. And same scenario as before, one right out the side, one out the quarter, one bit of an angle on the side of the boat and one down far and uh, that will come around. I, I sometimes will cast up on the shallow here, but um, I get a lot of brim and a lot of some of the sand crabs and, and, you close, and this, this actually bank here drops down deep again. So it might go from one and a half meters down to three meters on the edge because give it a current along there too and run into it. So um, there'll be fish traveling along there and you get the odd whiting, but you'll get a lot more bycatch of vermin, catfish eels, uh, and stuff you don't want to catch, toadfish, whatever. The main variety of fish are gonna be feeding along here, okay? Um, if I went out late in the afternoon, I got the last to run out tide, which I really like, as I said, last half hour or hour, I'll fish that same scenario. Now, as the tide starts to come back in, I don't want to sit out the deep here and fish back onto the shallows because they're not going to be there. They're going to be, okay, they're going to be complete opposite to that down this end of town. So where that bank goes along and then drops into a little dip here, um, there might be another little one over here, I'll then position my boat. Um, I'll position my boat probably in this area here. Like so, I'm oh, sorry, I'm way around. It's the back of the boat, the motor's there, the anchor's there. And I'll be casting out this direction here and the odd one out there. And I'll be feeding all on this edge here and around the corner here. And uh, that's on the running tide. So I've, I've gone along 1.5 meters. I don't know over there, it's five meters. I've gone along, this drops down to two and a half. So I think, okay, there's a, a good meter full in the bank. They're gonna be feeding along that edge as the tide is running in this way now, before it's going out, now it's running in. Um, I'll do that, or I'll move down to, I'll go, it'll come back up again, same deal again, meter and a half deep, it'll drop down to two and a half or three meters, and I'll put the boat just here, and I'll fish that whole side and this back corner here in that area, because that's where the fish will be feeding again. So you need to work out where they're gonna be feeding, and use your sounder and use your plotter, because at night time, it's quite awkward to understand uh, actually where you are in, in when it's dark, you haven't got many lights. So you need to know where you are by using your plotter and watching your track when you're drifting, so you know where to drop the anchor out and sit right on the spot. Um, some places up in Rang River get quite busy. Um, there might be 30 boats and up in there on a Saturday night. So you have to be a, a bit um, is ethics and, uh, and politely get in where you can. And if you can't get in there, you just don't go in there. Try somewhere else. Uh, but yeah, that's the scenario that I like to use. Now, when I'm fishing, um, 
Sorry, folks. I'm over here. I'm coming back. Hey, doing? Um, I'm using uh, uh, my little rod like this. I've cast out. I've got my big ball, four ball sinker on. I'm ripping out about two or three knots. Um, what I do is once I've cast it out, let's throw that out there for a second. I just lean it up against something um, with the tip just sitting like that. If you can see the tip there, I hope you can, I think you can. Um, when I see, I'm watching my rod tips all the time. Um, sometimes I'll sit down, but I'll generally stand up and I'll watch my rods and I know exactly where to grab them. And when I see a bite like so, okay, I know it's a bite. If you've got a bit of boat movement, it'll move around a bit, but when it's a bite, it's more sharp and, and more aggressive. So I see the bite. What I do, if you um, pull on that line to lift your rod up, sometimes they'll, they'll have it halfway down their throat and they'll <laughs> spit it out because they've just felt something not right. Um, so there's a couple of little tricks you can do. One is you can, um, I'll just do this real quickly, you can lift your line up, as you lift your rod up, you open your bale up and just strip a bit of line off so it goes out uh, nice and softly and the fish doesn't feel hardly any resistance. Um, if you've done that, um, that's good. The other thing you can do is when you pick your rod up, sorry for a sec, so we go there, look at the bite happening. When you pick your rod up, you actually, as you pick it up, um, you actually lean your, extend your arm out and they won't feel much difference because you've actually given them a bit of slack to adjust your uh, rod coming up and uh, hold it ready to go. You'll feel the bite, you'll feel the bite. Some people like to hold like this. It's up to you. I hold mine on my, my finger like so. If you can see that, my finger's holding the line there. Um, and I feel it, and I generally hold two fingers sometimes. And as they're biting, um, with the biting, they're dum dum dum. You'll feel it sometimes go tight. And then when it's down their throat, I think they know the hook's right down. And they start to get a little bit flighty, and it's like ding ding ding, ding like that sort of feel. Um, at that time, they're well and truly hooked and you just lift up on the rod, they're on there. Um, other times, you'll feel them taking it down, taking it down, they just extend your arm out, like I say, let them take it down, they'll go tight, and then you're on. Have your drag set reasonably soft. This got set from the other night, it's a bit noisy, it's got a bit of work, it's real. Uh, but uh, uh, have it set reasonably light, but when, they, when you're playing it, don't go crazy on one, it's nice and slow. But when you get it close to the boat, um, they will dive down. So let them take that little bit of line off. If you do it too tight, it can actually pull out of their throat or with its lip hook, sometimes it'll fall off. So have your drag set not too loose, not too tight, just nice. They can still pull a little bit of line off. If you're using an LB reel, a little bit different scenario. Oh gosh, this rod's so long. <laughs> um, but when you've got an LB on, the, the bite's happening, you pick it up, as you pick it up, you actually let a bit of line out. You can't see that slugs are I'm doing that, but you're winding backwards and letting out line as you've got it. You've got it in your fingers again, in this part of your finger, lines in here. Um, and you watch the rod tip, you feel it, you let it take it down. You can extend it out if you want, or you just wind a little bit of line out with the, with the hand handle. As in that type of scenario, if you can see that. Okay, and I'm going to take it, take it, take it, and then bang, you're on. And when you get the fish close to the boat with an alvey, if you don't have a clutch on it, and you've got him in, you get the current, and you're diving, 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 just let a little bit out, let him take it a little tiny bit, keep it under pressure though, but don't just hold it there and well, someone's going to give in, um, because sometimes, again, the hook can pop out. So let a little bit of line out if you have to, and then wind it back in. I find if you lift the rod tip up the last button, you can see that sinker coming, like say, uh, around about 60 centimetres from the rod tip, that's when you just then lift the rod out of the water, you pull his head out of the water, you've got him. Um, if you keep the rod tip down, down close to the water, he's just going to stay down there diving, 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 and probably the hook will come out. So you need to um, know exactly when you see the, 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 rod tip, uh, the swivel or the sinker coming, um, lift, just lift the rod up and pull him out. Don't want the sinker right to the tip of the rod because you'll never be able to grab it right up there. You've got to actually learn to swing the fish in about the length of the rod to the fish. So it comes straight in here under your arm. Okay. Um, next thing I want to teach you is put the fish on. How do you get the fish out? It's got the hook right down its gut. Okay. 
So um, what you do is you use your thumb. My thumb's sort of cut off badly from doing it, but um, and then we're going to eat the fish, okay? So I know it's a bit of humane, but you got to cut this right open to get the hook out. Or do it this way. So what I do is you drop where the where the underbody is and the gills meet to the body. Okay. You put your thumb into the soft membrane there and slide your thumb up and slit his lip open, the bottom lip. And then you grab your line tight onto the hook and just pull it through down through where you just slit it and the eye of the hook will be right there where your thumb is in. And you just pop it out and, and the hook comes straight out. Or you can see there anything right on. But remember a lot of time at night time it's, it's a bit hard to see that, so you feel it all, it's all by feel. Uh, you get used to it, <laughs> okay? Last thing I teach is putting the worm on properly, really important. So we put the worm on, so let's grab this hook here. And the reel's a bit noisy, isn't it? Actually, I'm gonna grab that one stuck on the carpet. Take two, we'll use this one. So grab the hook here. I'm gonna come over closely. We're gonna see my face, you're about to hear me, but I wanna show you, do this in front of you here. Hopefully you can see what I'm doing. Um, so this is the worm here, okay? And this is the hook. So I have to do it from this way, actually. I'm gonna see it from the side I'm doing it. Maybe I can. Like that. Okay. So what we do is we put this on here like this. So you never start at the top. You start down a little bit, okay? You can see that. Start down a little bit, so down here. Hook goes in here. So that part's actually just loose on the end there, okay? Whether it be alive or dead, that's gonna help us out. So just keep threading it up, just keep threading up, thread up. When you get near the bottom here, just poke it out just a little bit. And this part here, pull up over the eye of the hooks, just like so. Your hooks just about disappeared, right? Two things, the bottom part can still wiggle because you've left a little tail on there. And the top part, whether it be dead or alive, it moves around, whether it be in the current, when it's dead, or if it's alive, it's definitely going to move around. And that's what attracts the fish, and that's what makes you get a lot of fish. Okay, just like so. So give that a shot. So here you go. Um, I think that's about all we've got to tell you. So um, keep, I, I always uh, put my worm, uh, yabbies, uh, sorry, my um, fish into an ice slurry, salt water and ice. And whiting is so, so beautiful, such a beautiful fish, don't waste it, please. So put it in the ice slurry, keep your esky closed, and not something that's hot. So just get half a bucket, maybe 10 whiting, six whiting, and throw them into the ice slurry. As if they're on thick, and then every half a dozen fish, you just put them back into the ice. Um, the other thing I do too is constantly changing the water in my bait, particularly yabbies if I do use yabbies, but worms 100%. Um, you need to constantly keep that water temperature fairly cool and, and consistent and if it gets too warm or if it's stagnant, um, the bait will really get sick and die pretty quick. So keep your bait fresh as you can. Um, I think that's probably about it. So uh, good luck out there and if you've got any questions, uh, you're welcome to come in now. This is at Douglas Tackle World here at, um, at uh, 11 slash 8 Centre View Drive. When you type that in, guys, just type in 8 Centre View Drive at uh, Bigger Waters. It's a lot easier to find. Thank you very much, and uh, I'll catch you another time. Thank you. Bye-bye.